Good afternoon, all. Uh, my name is Zori Boozer. I'm a faculty at Keck School of Medicine at University of Southern California. And today's talk will focus on growth factors and scaffolds for disc uh, regeneration. Quickly, here are my disclosures, really no conflicts of interest for uh, the, today's talk. So before we dive into the growth factors and scaffolds, I think it's important to have a quick uh, high level view on where we stand with spine pathologies when it comes to costs and trends. And this study recently published in JAMA looked at the US healthcare spending based uh, by different type of insurance uh, providers as well pathologies. And as expected, low back and neck pain were one of the leading pathologies when it comes to costs in both public insurance and actually on top uh, in the private insurance with almost 77, 77 billion, and as well as in out of pocket payments. And there are different factors that play a role in these high spendings, but one of them is definitely that we still have an increasing number of patients with spine uh, pathologies. And this study done by Safiri and uh, colleagues actually looked at global and regional trends in neck pain. And what you can see on this map is that deep purple represents the lowest incidence, annual incidence, whereas the deep red regions represent the highest. In the United States, we are on the higher end with 900 to 950 uh, patients uh, per 100,000 patients uh, with neck pain uh, problems. And when we look at the demographics, um, female patients have higher incidences. This is this orange uh, full line, uh, higher incidence of neck pain pathologies than uh, male patients, which is the full purple line. But the interesting trend, and that's been reported previously, but the interesting trend, I think, is this shift in the younger population that we are seeing higher uh, incidence of uh, neck pain pathologies uh, in younger patients starting with age 35 and above, which I think it's very important when we think about the regenerative strategies for a disc. So, and that leads us to what are the options? Well, there are several options. Dr. Wong spoke about stem cells. So stem cells, as well as the disc cells, there are several clinical trials and studies uh, have been uh, done and are still in progress. Then there are different scaffolds and as well proteins, either synthetic proteins or uh, virally expressed uh, proteins. So what are the protein-based therapies and what do they do? They uh, obviously can be intradiscal injections, can be standalone or with a scaffold or cells. And really the main role of proteins, the way they regenerate is to induce the matrix synthesis and potentially reduce that inflammation. So here are the most common growth factors that have been used in the disc field. And GDF5 and PRP are really the ones that have clinical evidence or clinical studies. And these are the ones we will be briefly focusing and covering in this talk. So PRP, as we know, has four to five times higher concentration of platelets than the whole blood. The main component of PRP are growth factors. And the recent studies found that there are over 3,000 bioactive proteins, which makes PRP very attractive, but also very challenging to understand. And there are different types of PRP, depending on the leukocyte count, as well as the fibrin density. And the main role of PRP is to decrease inflammation, and it's been used as an anti-inflammatory agent. But when we think about this, it's really to promote that soft tissue healing. That would be the ideal goal of PRP. So where do we stand when it comes to PRP and intradiscal repair? All studies, uh, there are nine published studies. All of them are on lumbar spine. And unfortunately, there is a lot of variation between these studies in the number of patients, starting blood volume, how much PRP has been injected, many levels within the same patient, and also the follow-up, very critical. So if we have a very quick look at, and this was a recent systematic review um, uh, done by Yurtes and uh, colleagues, these are the three RCTs. And you can see super busy table, not meant to be read, but there is a 22 patients, their difference in the population from 22 to 47. The Levy and colleagues allowed for 90 months of a failed um, 
uh, treatment prior to injection, where the other two studies were only really enrolling patients with more than three or six months. So very much of a difference in definition of pain and how much they've been under the conservative uh, treatment. Then also intervention on how much a PRP was injected and which uh, PROs were collected and at what time point. The third study only looked up to eight weeks where the first study went out and looked all the way, I believe, to uh, six months and one and the one looked at one year. So really a lot of different follow-ups, the amount of PRP. At the end of the day, all three RCTs found improvement uh, when it comes to PROs. Uh, on uh, MRIs, they didn't see any differences in this kite or changes in the disc. And also um, as the third study concluded, really it was hard to draw uh, clear conclusions uh, for uh, pain and functional scores due to the small sample sizes. And this is another recent clinical trial, again, similar study design. And what's important to see here, and really when we talk about PROs, so they measured NRS and ODI at three and six months post-injection and looked at the number of patients who had more than 50% of reduction in score. And as you can see, at three months, only a small fraction really saw an improvement. But at six months, uh, there were almost more than 50%, uh, not more, but more than 50% who saw an improvement. So it's important to well-define those outcomes and also the time points when. So this is where we stand with the current clinical trials when it comes to PRP. Uh, the study in yellow is really the only study that included thoracic and cervical discogenic, back, uh, uh, discogenic pain patients. All the other studies are low back pain patients. This study uh, is with the cervical patients is completed. Um, they planned actually to enroll 180, ended up only enrolling 27, and the injection volume of PRP was up to one cc for thoracic or cervical spine and two cc's for lumbar. So it will be interesting to see these results as well, uh, see the results of the other studies that are uh, clinical trials that are still recruiting and have over 100 uh, patients. So. To kind of summarize with PRP, another challenge, this was a, a, a review paper published in JBJS a few years ago, is really a call for standardizing protocols for um, PRP concentration. And what they, this uh, reviewer did, they really looked at all different studies in the orthopedics and didn't only focus on PRP concentration, but also they looked at uh, like what type of a machine was used, how many centrifugations they underwent through. And you can see here that the reporting was very low in 56 to 20%. And then even when they reported these uh, steps, uh, their, the standard deviation was very high. And then when they um, divided it by different uh, joint and the amount of initial whole blood volume, you can see that we also see a lot of different volumes. Most of them were probably around seven, uh, starting 75 volume, but still very heterogeneous. And this becomes even more heterogeneous when we look at the number of studies and the final PRP volume. So most of the studies used up to six cc's, but even then um, comparing a study that used two versus six, is a threefold difference just uh, there. And then there are some that use more than uh, 10 cc's. So with PRP, uh, definitely still a lot of room for improvement uh, with protocols as well as uh, patient uh, reported outcomes and patient characteristics. So when it comes to GDF5, um, GDF5 only few clinical trials all over the pew, oral are completed. They were all focusing on the early stages of disc degeneration and they looked at the different doses, small sample size in all four of them and um, no published data on that. So now when we quickly look at the scaffolds, they provide not only bioactive component as growth factors, but they actually provide that biomechanical support um, to uh, both nucleus and annulus. And the type of scaffolds, well, this schematic of a healthy disc, different components of the disc uh, and the different types of 
degener degenerative changes shows all the potential of scaffolds have in uh, tissue engineering. And these are some of the most common scaffolds. We all know collagen, gelatin, alginate, PLA, PGA. Some of the newer ones are suture repair for annulus fibrosis and decellularized ECMs. So uh, decellularized ECMs um, started in 2011 and uh, the first human decellularized ECMs were uh, isolated in 2016. All it's preclinical, but in a way, these decellularized ECMs are look alike to DBM for spinal fusion. And I think if executed properly, they hold a huge potential in disc regeneration, because what that means is that uh, discs are isolated from a source, and then they are decellularized with different types of uh, methods, and then they can be repopulated with the cells of choice and potentially even additional growth factors and then re-injected into the spine, so uh, into the disc. So in, in a way they would provide both biomechanical and then the bioactive component to the disc and disc regeneration of the whole disc, not just one uh, structure. However, most of the scaffolds are really still preclinical animal and cellular uh, models. One of the scaffolds that actually had clinical evidence and lessons learned was fibrin sealant. And I will just quickly go over that because it's good lessons learned. And we were back when uh, I was at UCSF, we were involved with Biostat in all preclinical work that led before FDA and clinical trials. So we did both in vitro study where we used human cells, both annulus and nucleus cells. Uh, and encapsulated them in uh, scaffolds and exposed them to disc degenerative environment. And what we then looked at to see if fibrin can reduce inflammation, promote um, matrix production. And we saw that this is just a panel of different uh, cytokines. And what you can see, those uh, light gray bars are, are two controls where cytokines were still present and the bars you don't see were the groups with a fibrin where fibrin really reduced expression of the cytokines and promoted matrix synthesis. So in vitro data looked great. We moved into the large animal model, which was a mini peg, we did nucleotomy and one group just was injured the nucleotomy. The other one got injected with fibrin uh, sealant at, and followed up to three months. So you can see here fibrin sealant, the dotted line increased production of matrix, the injured group reduced. Same went with the uh, inflammatory panel, uh, fibrin sealant reduced inflammation and also biomechanically, fibrin sealant uh, discs uh, did better than injured or very, and they were very close to controls actually, fibrin discs. So then they went into the clinical trials, prelim clinical trial did well, but then in the phase three, fibrin sealant did as well as saline. So at that point, it was discontinued for nucleus regeneration. So a lot of lessons learned. And one of the key components is really that patient selection protocol. We don't have a standardized protocol. These are some of the main points we use when we think about regenerative strategies. And all of us who have been involved in various trials know that the exclusion and inclusion list are likely and they differ from trial to a trial. So really we need the standardization. And as future steps, I truly believe that these biologics are very promising, that we still have to um, preparation protocols, concentration of these, and then look at clinically relevant metrics in short and long-term outcomes. And the last, as the I started the slide, uh, presentation with costs, I think it's important to look at the value of biologics and really look at the cost of biologic versus outcomes over time. And with that, I would like to thank you all. Thanks.